In a world where legends collide, only the most captivating tales survive. One such story involves the enigmatic Elvis Presley and his supposed lack of chemistry with fellow superstars. His TV special with Frank Sinatra in 1960 bore no fruitful outcomes, and his meeting with the Beatles in 1965 left audiences craving for more. Even his encounter with Bob Dylan was described as inconsequential by the latter himself. However, there is one moment that sparks a flurry of curiosity among fans. Elvis's unexpected appearance at Sun Studios on December 4, 1956. Here, he joined forces with Carl Perkins and Jerry Lee Lewis for an impromptu jam session. Although Johnny Cash was present, he seemed more captivated by Christmas shopping than the historical event unfolding before him. This intriguing encounter gave birth to the Million Dollar Quartet, a Broadway, West End, and Las Vegas sensation that reimagines what could have happened if these icons had engaged in an epic jam session. The London production at the Noel Coward Theatre in June 2011 brought this tantalizing scenario to life. Disregarding historical accuracy, the jukebox musical allows audiences to indulge in a fantasy where Elvis Presley, Carl Perkins, Jerry Lee Lewis, and Johnny Cash come together for an unforgettable performance of 50s hits, regardless of whether they had been written at the time. Witty banter and dramatic tension between these legendary performers make for an engaging experience that keeps audiences enthralled throughout the one-hour, 45-minute show without an interval. The Million Dollar Quartet's success is evident in its continued staging, even in unexpected locations such as Liverpool in February 2017 with actor Jason Donovan portraying Sam Phillips. As fans and theatergoers alike continue to embrace this captivating tale of musical legend, it's clear that the spirit of the Million Dollar Quartet will endure for years to come. In the captivating world of Million Dollar Quartet, the year 1956 sets the stage for a musical extravaganza that transcends political commentary and plunges audiences into the heart of rock and roll history. As the curtain rises, anticipation mounts to witness the electrifying performances of legendary musicians Jerry Lee Lewis, Elvis Presley, Johnny Cash, and Carl Perkins. Jerry Lee Lewis, masterfully portrayed by Ben Goddard, dominates the scene with a comical flair reminiscent of Jerry Lewis himself. His one-dimensional performance, humorous at first, leaves him wondering how his fellow musicians could tolerate him. The audience eagerly awaits a confrontation between Jerry and the other artists, wagering on who will silence his antics. The script cleverly incorporates a tense moment where the deeply religious Jerry Lee ponders whether he is singing the devil's music, drawing parallels to a real-life conversation recorded by Sam Phillips. Goddard delivers an outstanding rendition of Real Wild Child, but it is great balls of fire and a whole lot of shaking going on that send the audience into a frenzy. Oliver Seymour Marsh as Carl Perkins also struggles to shine under the constraints of an unyielding script. The audience is left wondering if Carl genuinely resented Elvis Presley's cover of Blue Suede Shoes, given that it would have earned him songwriting royalties. This internal conflict, if true, might explain why Elvis chose not to record any more of Carl's songs. Regardless, Perkins delivers a remarkable performance, showcasing his guitar skills and harmonizing with the rest of the ensemble on tracks like Matchbox, Who Do You Love, and See You Later Alligator. The portrayal of Johnny Cash in Million Dollar Quartet raises some intriguing questions. Would the country music star have participated in a rock and roll jam session? Did he even know? I hear you knocking? Derek Hagen expertly captures Cash's essence, but his character is depicted as an enigmatic figure with a mysterious agenda within this high-energy setting. As the show unfolds, it becomes clear that each musician brings their unique talent and personality to the stage, creating an unforgettable musical experience steeped in the passion and energy of 1956. The audience is left to ponder the complex relationships between these legendary artists and how they navigated the tumultuous world of rock and roll during its infancy. In a captivating theatrical performance, the enigmatic tale of Carl Perkins, Elvis Presley, Johnny Cash, and Sam Phillips unfolded on stage. The atmosphere was thick with tension as secrets were revealed, dreams were pursued, and alliances tested. Carl Perkins found himself at a crossroads when Sam Phillips, the enigmatic music producer refused to let him record an album of gospel songs. This decision led Carl down a different path, signing with Columbia instead of renewing his contract with Sam. 
The dramatic moment when Carl declared his departure from Sun Records to Phillips was expertly portrayed by Michael Hagen, who also brought Carl's soulful voice to life through songs like Folsom Prison Blues, 16 Tons, I Walk the Line, and Riders in the Sky. Enter Elvis Presley, a charismatic force that could command any room. Michael Malarkey did his best to embody this legendary figure, but some felt he lacked the magnetic presence of Tim Whitnall's portrayal in the 1977 production. As Elvis, Malarkey delivered hits such as Memories Are Made Of This, That's All Right, Long Tall Sally, and Hound Dog. While his performance was solid, it couldn't quite capture the essence of the king himself. An intriguing moment from the original tapes, where Elvis spoke about Jackie Wilson imitating him in Las Vegas, was notably absent from the stage show. Its inclusion could have added an extra layer of intrigue and authenticity to the production. The minimalistic set design featured just one stage, which transformed into various locations throughout the performance. The climax saw all actors gathered around Elvis as he played the piano, recreating the iconic photograph taken on December 4, 1956. This moment of perfect synchronization between stage and screen elicited thunderous applause from the audience. The mystery surrounding the uncropped version of that photograph, which revealed a girl sitting on the piano, was addressed in the play. Here, Elvis's girlfriend was called Diane and brought to life by Francesca Jackson, who sang Fever and I Hear You Knocking. Two other musicians, Gez Gerard as Carl's brother Jay on bass and Alex Yates as W.S. Holland on drums, rounded out the quartet. Together, they performed a series of songs including Blue Suede Shoes, Brown-Eyed Handsome Man, Down by the Riverside, and Peace in the Valley. The play's script, penned by noted researcher Colin Eskett and Floyd Muttrix, director of American Hot Wax and Urban Cowboy, was written with a tongue-in-cheek style. While it occasionally bent the truth, its true intention lay in exploring the deeper truths behind these legendary figures' lives and their impact on the music industry. In the heart of Tennessee, a family's struggles and tensions provided an unparalleled source of inspiration for young Carl Perkins. Born into poverty, Carl was one of three sons raised by Buck and Louise Perkins, sharecroppers struggling to make ends meet in Tiptonville. The brothers, Jay, Carl, and Clayton, learned the harsh realities of life at a young age, picking cotton from sunrise to sunset. Carl's fragile health, plagued by pneumonia and scarlet fever, set him apart from his siblings. But it was this very vulnerability that imbued his songs with an authenticity that resonated deeply with listeners. His lyrics spoke of the gritty realities of life he knew all too well, taking a girl to the movies on horseback in Movie Mag, and the tumultuous barroom brawl recounted in Dixie Fried. The family's trials and tribulations were seemingly endless. Carl's brother Clayton, at only 14 years old, had joined the Marines under false pretenses. When his deception was discovered, he was ordered to return, but the thought of going back filled him with dread. In a desperate bid to avoid military service, Clayton took drastic action. He shot himself in the foot. The intriguing tales that emerged from Carl Perkins' family life were woven into his music, making him an authentic voice of his time and place. As he navigated the tumultuous world of rock and roll, these experiences would serve as a constant reminder of where he came from, a humble beginning filled with struggle and drama that would forever shape his unique artistic perspective. Amidst the tumultuous life of the Perkins brothers, a secret was brewing. Carl, with his undeniable talent, had caught the eye of Sam Phillips. However, the band's chaotic dynamic, Jay's steadfastness juxtaposed against Clayton's wild and unpredictable nature, made it difficult for them to appeal to the teenage market. As Carl struggled to find his footing between emulating Jay and succumbing to Clayton's reckless behavior, a tragic event loomed on the horizon. In March 1956, a car accident left Carl with a fractured skull and broken shoulder, Jay with a broken neck, and Clayton with minor injuries. The band was left reeling, unsure of their future. But these strong, resilient individuals refused to let adversity break them. Just a month after the accident, they were back on stage, albeit with a replacement for Jay. Carl's triumphant return at the Big D Jamboree Tour was met with both relief and amazement as he announced the birth of his son before launching into Honey Don't. However, Jay's recovery was not as smooth. Plagued by debilitating headaches and an addiction to painkillers, he could no longer serve as a peacemaker between Carl and Clayton. 
Their collaboration with Johnny Cash only exacerbated the tension, as Cash seemed to encourage Clayton's reckless behavior. The recording sessions at Sun produced mixed results. Some songs like Bob Pin, The Blues, and Dixie Fried soared to great heights, while others like Pink Pedal Pushers and That Don't Move Me fell flat. As the Perkins brothers navigated their tumultuous journey through success and struggle, they held on to hope that their music would ultimately triumph over adversity. Little did they know that their story was far from over and that the secrets they kept hidden beneath their guitars and bass would continue to unravel, adding another layer of intrigue to their already captivating tale. The enigmatic Sam Phillips, a visionary producer, had been working tirelessly with a variety of artists throughout the year, including Rufus Thomas and Roscoe Gordon. However, he noticed that one of his original stars, Carl Perkins, was losing his edge in the rapidly evolving world of rock and roll. To rekindle Carl's passion and give his music a fresh spin, Sam decided to bring in a young, talented producer named Jack Clement to assist him. But that wasn't all. Sam had heard about an exceptionally gifted but equally arrogant entertainer by the name of Jerry Lee Lewis. Born in Faraday, Louisiana, Jerry Lee was as young as Elvis and shared a similar fire in his performance. In November, Jerry Lee and his father had traveled to Memphis with hopes of catching Sam Phillips' attention. And catch it he did. Jerry Lee's debut single, Crazy Arms, was released just weeks later. Impressed by the young musician's talent, Sam asked Jack Clement to collaborate with Jerry Lee. It was on a chilly Tuesday afternoon, December 4th, that Carl Perkins found himself back in the Sun Records studio, working on new tracks. Sam Phillips had high hopes for this session. He believed that the addition of Jerry Lee's unique style would not only make the music more commercially appealing, but also help Carl move away from his typical rockabilly sound. When Carl and Jerry Lee first met, it was clear that they were two very different personalities. However, Jerry Lee quickly recognized the potential in Carl's new song, Your True Love, and knew how he could elevate it with his own flair. The resulting performance was energetic and lively, though Carl's pitch wasn't always perfect. As the session continued, tensions between Jerry Lee and Carl's guitarist, Clayton, began to rise. But despite the underlying friction, Sam Phillips was thrilled with the direction their collaboration had taken. The intrigue surrounding this impromptu musical partnership would go on to shape the course of rock and roll history, paving the way for a genre that would later be known as psychobilly. Extraordinary gathering took place at the Sun Records studio. The room was filled with musical geniuses, including Carl Perkins and his brothers, Jerry Lee Lewis, and Buck Perkins, all eager to create something remarkable. Their focus? A song called Matchbox, a tune that had been previously recorded by Blind Lemon Jefferson in 1927. As they worked on the track, tensions rose between Jerry Lee and Carl, the former unable to resist commenting on the latter's creation. That's a hit, Carl, he said, while Jerry Lee retorted with a hint of disdain, that song ain't worth a damn. Carl sought advice from his father about the original version of Matchbox, and together they worked on perfecting the lyrics. After a brief break, during which Carl indulged in a little early times Kentucky whiskey, they were ready for their first take. The result was raw and energetic, with Carl's guitar skills shining through. Jerry Lee's boogie riff added an extra layer of excitement to the track. Just as they prepared for another take, an unexpected guest arrived. Elvis Presley himself. It had been a year since Carl last saw the now iconic singer, who had risen to fame as the biggest star in the US. His hair was jet black now, and he had just returned from a holiday in Las Vegas with his house guest, the stunning Marilyn Evans. Elvis took an interest in their work, requesting a playback of Matchbox. He praised Carl and the band for their efforts, calling it a killer track. However, his presence inevitably disrupted the momentum of their recording session, known as the Million Dollar Quartet. Sam Phillips, ever the opportunist, saw this as an opportunity to create a spectacle. He summoned Johnny Cash and asked him to join them in the studio immediately. He also contacted the Memphis Pressmitter newspaper, requesting a photographer to capture this once-in-a-lifetime event. George Pierce arrived with his camera accompanied by reporter Bob Johnson and Leo Soroka from United Press International. Elvis sat down at the piano and began to noodle around on the keys. Jerry Lee couldn't help but comment on his unexpected musical ability, a remark that may have been unwise given Elvis's star power. 
As Johnny Cash entered the room, the atmosphere shifted once more, the press buzzing with excitement at the sight of these legendary musicians gathered together. Amidst the intrigue and tension, one thing was certain, the music they were creating in that studio would go down in history as a testament to the raw talent and passion of the era's most iconic artists. In an unexpected twist of fate, a photograph captured the legendary gathering of Elvis Presley, Carl Perkins, Jerry Lee Lewis, and Johnny Cash, fondly referred to as the Million Dollar Quartet. However, what many didn't know is that this impromptu session was recorded. Bob Johnson, upon seeing the photo, lamented the missed opportunity for a potentially successful collaboration. Little did he know, the tapes were already rolling, capturing their uninhibited renditions of songs like Blueberry Hill. The musicians, aware that RCA would never sanction such an event, performed solely for their own amusement. Elvis even requested an acoustic guitar during the session, adding to the informal atmosphere. Johnny Cash, who had to leave early to pick up his wife Vivian, later recalled joining in on Blueberry Hill and Isle of Golden Dreams. Despite his absence from some parts of the recording, he insisted that he was present throughout the session. In a surprising revelation, Johnny Cash clarified in a 1993 interview that the Million Dollar Quartet wasn't truly just four members. He explained how he and Elvis started the session with gospel songs before Jerry Lee Lewis joined them on piano. Smokey Joe Baugh, another Sun artist, also contributed to the performances by adding his bass voice. The truth behind the Million Dollar Quartet's legendary performance is even more captivating than initially believed, with a cast of talented musicians and an element of secrecy that added to their allure. In 1955, at the legendary Sun Records, a secret gathering of musical talents occurred that would go down in history as the fabled Million Dollar Quartet session. The room was teeming with luminaries such as Sam Phillips, Jack Clement, Carl Perkins, Jay Perkins, Clayton Perkins, Buck Perkins, W.S. Holland, Jerry Lee Lewis, Johnny Cash, Charles Underwood, Elvis Presley, Marilyn Evans, Bob Johnson, George Pierce, Leo Soroka, and Smokey Joe Ba. The atmosphere was electric, yet unguarded. Marion Kiesker stood by the door as the only security measure. As the session unfolded, musicians performed over 35 songs in a free-flowing, informal jam session that lasted for 50 minutes. Their repertoire encompassed various genres such as country, gospel, blues, and rock and roll, creating an eclectic mix of Southern music. The recordings were made without the knowledge or preparation of the musicians, resulting in a raw and unpolished sound that captures the spontaneity of the moment. The star of these impromptu recordings was undoubtedly Elvis Presley. He shared anecdotes about his experiences in Vegas, where he had seen Billy Ward and his dominoes perform. Elvis found particular amusement in Jackie Wilson's impression of him singing Don't Be Cruel, which he watched no less than four times. Elvis also attempted to impersonate Bill Monroe and Ernest Tubb during the session, showcasing his versatility as a performer. Marilyn Evans had her moment when she requested, farther along, adding another layer of diversity to the session's repertoire. Meanwhile, Carl Perkins took the lead on Win Stewart's song. This captivating event was witnessed by Sam Phillips and Jack Clement, who observed the unfolding musical magic from a distance, allowing the artists to express themselves freely and authentically. The Million Dollar Quartet session remains an iconic moment in music history, embodying the raw energy, creativity, and camaraderie of the era's most influential musicians. It serves as a testament to the power of spontaneity and the enduring legacy of Sun Records. During this extraordinary day, the trio experimented with various tracks, including a bluesy rendition of Reconsider Baby that would later blossom into one of Elvis's finest records in 1960. Their love for Chuck Berry's music was evident as they performed Brown-Eyed Handsome Man in Too Much Monkey Business, demonstrating their shared passion for the genre. Elvis confessed that he had initially been offered Pat Boone's hit song, Don't Forbid Me, before it went to the latter. He proceeded to deliver a complete version of his own composition, Paralyzed. Meanwhile, Jerry Lee performed his single, Crazy Arms, and showcased his impressive vocal range by finishing off the session with four short songs as Elvis and Carl bid their farewells. These historic tapes remained under copyright restrictions for three decades, only to surface as bootlegs of subpar quality. 
It wasn't until 1990 that an official CD was issued, revealing a clearer representation of the musical magic that had transpired during this remarkable day. Despite the creation of a jukebox musical based on these events, some argue that the true essence of rock and roll history would be better served by adhering to the original tapes and focusing on the raw. Unfiltered energy that defined this iconic encounter between Elvis Presley, Carl Perkins, and Jerry Lee Lewis. What made this gathering all the more intriguing was the dynamic among the artists themselves. While Jerry Lee saw himself as an equal to Elvis, Carl preferred to take a supporting role, content with his guitar licks rather than pursuing center stage. This unique blend of personalities and talents not only created unforgettable music, but also left an indelible mark on the annals of rock and roll history.